Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, in for Josh Lindsay, who's off on an amazing vacation. And with us, as always, is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Jason. Thanks so much for being here. Although you just like got here from the skin of your teeth because you were also out in, I think, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. So Josh is, uh, he's not in Hollywood, but I was, I was out, yeah, I was out that way. So yeah. we I probably flew over him on the way home. Yeah, because I do think he went out that way. He went out west, maybe Wyoming, and then he's coming back through Nevada. I think he did some like Route 66 fun stuff. Yeah. 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 So he and I were probably uh, around Route 66 on the same time because I was in Pasadena where Route 66 cuts through for half a day. So we were probably on the same road, just a couple states apart. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you. I'm glad you're here. I hope everything went well for you out there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing? Because I think yours was not really vacation, was it? Yeah, it was a lot of meetings. It was a lot of reconnecting with people who I knew from before the pandemic or, well, actually, I only met one person out there who I'd met before besides Sean, who who we know. Um, I Everyone else was people who I met during the pandemic over Zoom who I got to meet in person. So that, that was really fun to just that actually get to see people in real life <laughs> yeah for sure so yeah and were you uh doing stuff for your own personal projects uh, a little bit of both so i am currently working social media on a movie um called secret agent dingledorf and his trusty dog splat um, right. and so part of the trip was for that we got to uh, work with the writer and have some meetings with some people about um what that process is looking like and we got to make a lot of social media assets um, I also did some animation on that movie. Um, initially, why I was going out in the first place was to see the movie, but the theatrical release, it's a very limited theatrical release in California, pretty much. Um, but the uh, movie release got pushed because Boss Baby pushed their release up. So, yeah, That's so, summer. yeah, but it was fun. It was fun. It was a great trip. Well, congratulations on that gig. We'll have to hear more about that for sure as that boogies along. But uh yeah, well, yeah. while you were doing that, there was some not fun stuff happening in the Girl Who Wore Freedom world. Yeah, so, I want to hear about this. Yeah, there's uh, the School of Hard Knocks continues for Christian Taylor. Um, once again, this is uh, how not to make a documentary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so get your pen and paper, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sit right down and start taking notes because this last one is a doozy. So basically what happened was um, my, I live in DuPage County in um, Illinois, and they released a brand new grant uh, for our county called Relief Grant DuPage, and it was COVID related, and they had lots of funds to give away to small businesses in DuPage County, which is, of course, where I reside. So I went to a workshop, learned about it. I was one of the very first that applied. You're allowed to um, apply for up to $50,000. The um, funds have to be used towards, you know, actual bills like utilities and payroll, uh, which is perfectly fine because I haven't taken a salary since ever. And there are plenty of other people that haven't either. And my hope was we would begin to be able to pay people um, as well as pay for some of our typical utilities and subscriptions and things like that. So I asked for the full amount of $50,000. And when I was sent back the papers to fill out um, proof of why we needed the money, that one of the things they asked for was a letter of good standing, which I thought, no problem. I pay my bills. This should be easy. Well, I went, I told my accountant, to please go and get the you know certificate of good standing. And she came back to me and um, she said, well, I've just got a glass of wine and I really need to talk to you. <laughs> I was like, um, is this bad? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> She's like, well, it's not exactly good. So in researching what we needed to get the certificate of good standing in Illinois, she realized that we needed to get the certificate of good standing from the state of Delaware. Now, many people know that most film projects, especially in Hollywood, but just about anywhere, people uh, prefer, and it's not just film projects, it's lots of businesses prefer to incorporate in Delaware, which is what my attorney told me to do. And he actually contracted with Harvard Business Services, which is a register agent 
there in Delaware. They're the ones that do the work for you. And then they, um, you know, pay you a registered agent fee and they make sure to send you notices for when you need to pay bills and things like that. So my attorney, um, you know, got us registered in the state of Delaware, got us all set up and, um, and then, you know, sent me the information and the papers that I needed in 2018 and we were off to the races. Um, now we all know that I am in Illinois and I am doing business here. Um, but when we went to get the certificate of good standing from the state of Delaware, we discovered we, in fact, were not in good standing. And uh -oh. in fact, not only were we not in good standing, we basically weren't a business because we, um, it had been three years since we paid any taxes or any registered agent fees. Oh, that no. is because when my attorney um, filled out the paperwork and stuff like that, he filled in himself as the person that was getting all of the notices. He was the contact person. So I never got any notices. I didn't know anything about anything that was due. Again, I was brand new. I didn't understand much about doing a business in Delaware and anything like that. And um, I just expected that this attorney would forward letters or tell me what I needed to do or something like that. Well, needless to say, nothing went paid. And so we were um, out of compliance and basically we're not a functioning company. And when I went to look at reinstating us and paying our bills, the total fee for back taxes, registered agent fees and penalties and stuff like that was over $3,000. Oh now gosh. you would think that is a pretty, pretty big lick and, you know, pretty depressing. And it was, but it was nowhere near what happened next. <laughs> And oh, what no. happened next was I then went to get the certificate of good standing in Illinois and realized that my attorney neglected to file um, a paper that needed to be filed to say that we could operate legally in Illinois. So for the last three years, we've been operating illegally in Illinois. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was, this was horrific. Now here's yeah. the other thing. There was a deadline. I had seven days to turn in all of these papers for this grant. And you know how government takes, how long it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, fortunately, when you do pay the money, um, you get things more quickly. And so with uh, Delaware, I was able to pay all the money up front. We did have it in our account. I had to pay expedited fees, but I got the certificate of good standing and the paperwork that I needed to go to Illinois. And I did find out that if I went in person to um, you know, Chicago to file this paperwork and figure out how much I owed, um, I could have an expedited fee and maybe I would get it the next day or something like that. So I went down to um, right around Daly Plaza. I went into the um, Secretary of State's office and I met the most wonderful man. I have thanked God for him every single day. He was so incredibly helpful. It was the exact opposite of what you think about going to the Secretary of State's office for anything. Driver's license, business things. It was unbelievable. This guy was walking all over the place. He was helping everybody. There was hardly anybody in there. Everybody had a smile on their face. Like, I mean, that was the shining light in this whole terrible saga, but he, um, looked at all my paperwork and he came over to me and he sat down beside me and he said, this is what it's going to take in order for you to get a letter of good standing. And I thought it was probably $700, but I misread the zeros. It was over $7,000 oh that gosh. I had to pay in penalties, back taxes, um, other fees, and of course the expedited fee. And I didn't have the money. But the thing is, if I didn't pay the fee, I mean, tons of things could happen to me at this point, not to mention not even getting the grant. So I had to figure out quickly how I was going to pay for this. And um, really the only way that I could do it was charging it. And sadly, because there were $7,000 of charging I was going to put on a card, 
um, we now will be charged interest, you know, not only on the $7,000, but we will also have to pay the merchant fees for using a card as opposed to using a check. But I couldn't use a check because I didn't have the money. And it was too expensive, too much, you know, interest to use a, you know, cash advance on the cards. It was a mess. But, you know, we had to go through all this in a very short amount of time to make a decision in order to pay the bill, in order to get the certificate of good standing, in order to get my paperwork in on time so that I could, you know, be considered for this grant. So that was a very, very bad week uh, last week. Um, yeah, I, yep. I, I don't think that was a good week. <laughs> nope. Nope. That was super hard lessons learned. Um, Understatement of the week there, Christian. <laughs> yep. Yep. And oh I have gosh. to say there were some bright lights. Melissa Perkins, my uh, bookkeeper, was the one that helped me do a lot of the paperwork and figuring out this problem. Uh, she, you know, helped me figure out where I had to go in Chicago. And she was just, you know, hugely instrumental in getting that done. Um, and then there was, you know, the people at that Secretary of State's office in Chicago who were an incredible blessing. So um, and then uh, because I was so nice and helpful and thankful to that guy Instead of it taking two days for me to get that certificate, I got it the same day. And uh, he made sure to push it through for me to get it in. And um, so that was a blessing. Now, what are the lessons learned here? Let's just stop for a second. (laughs) First of all, lesson one, I still agree that incorporating in Delaware for a film project is the way to go. But when and, and you need to have a registered agent there. And when you do that, you need to be careful for who you put on there as the contact person and make sure that person is going to be responsible to either pay the fees that needed to be paid every year or forward them on to the people who do. Um, So that's that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, if you are going to incorporate in Delaware, you need to make sure that you file papers to operate in the state where you are living. Uh, it's just a short little form. It isn't that big of a deal. You send it in in duplicate and, you know, you're approved. You will then have to pay taxes in, in Delaware and the state in which you live, but it's really not that much money. It's just staying on top of that and making sure that you are getting those, uh, those notices. And then lesson number three, make sure you do it every year and that you don't incur penalties or interest. Um, So make sure that you are on top of that. Everybody needs to pay taxes and other fees every year for their business. So there you go. And I guess make sure that you have the money in the bank uh, for any crises or (laughs) (laughs) things that pop up, just like regular life. Always have a savings. And and emergency fee is probably a a good idea. Yes. (laughs) Or emergency fund emergency fund. Wow. Okay. So besides all that, do you have any updates on the actual grant? Are you, have you, you've submitted for it? We did submit for it. We got my paperwork in on time. They said um, that this past, this week, this week that we're in today's Wednesday, July 14th. uh, By the way, it's Bastille Day. Happy Bastille Day, people in France. Um, Yeah. So, um, This week, they are looking at the grant and finding out if we qualify. Um, You know, we had to show that we had a loss in 2020, which we did um, from the previous year. And a lot of that was because our donations plummeted and we haven't sold, you know, the film or made any money back from that. So um, we were able to easily show that we had had a loss. We had to show where we were going to spend the money if we have, um, if we were if we get it. So we had to put a document together about that. Um, we had to show our tax returns and we had to show this letter of good standing. And so all that's done. Now we're just waiting for uh, the final determination. I don't know in my gut, I'm kind of feeling like it won't happen, but here's the thing. If we hadn't gone to apply for it, we would have never found out this other stuff. And so I look at this as a you know, a gift anyway, that we discovered the, we were, you know, out of compliance in both states and I had the opportunity to fix it and make it right. And, you know, I learned something going forward. 
<laughs> if you hadn't caught it, do you have any idea what the consequences would have been? Eventually, there would be some consequences. I mean, eventually I would get audited or eventually I would get caught in some way and the fees would be much bigger. I would have had to pay the taxes anyway, both in Delaware and in Illinois. The issue is they would be smaller over a three year period of time. There wouldn't be any penalties, stuff like that. It just did, that it was all I mean, the penalties in Illinois for being you know, operating illegally was $2,000 alone, just the penalties. So, so no, like prison time or anything that wasn't on the right. table. <laughs> that was not on the table. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, the, you know, I had, I did a, we did a podcast a long time ago where I talked about the importance of having a business manager handling the business. Right. Um, and I still stand by that. This business stuff of film is, um, Super important and honestly, not what a lot of us are gifted at in the creative field. Right. And so I really think I can't suggest strongly enough that you have a left brain business person, somebody on somewhere on your team, uh, you know, for lack of a better analogy, a Roy Disney uh, to help you out. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I think I've heard it said many times and I totally agree is that I got into creative things because I'm not good at numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm terrible at numbers. You know, what's even harder is that I did hire somebody who is better at numbers and who's better at the legal stuff and who I really thought have, would have that buttoned up. But you know what? He made a mistake. He made a mistake. Mistakes happen. Um, you know, I am upset. But um, and we are going to have to have a conversation about um, about that and about compensation for that. Um, maybe there is sort of a I don't know, a, a, a refund of, uh, you know, of a sort uh, where maybe he can do work going forward on the Brave Dutch because I need some legal work on that done right away. So I don't know. We'll have to see um, what will come of that. But speaking um, of the Brave Dutch, do you have any uh, updates yeah, about the Brave Dutch? I do. Uh, it's been an exciting week where this is concerned. So uh, we got the first draft from Virgil Films, the good people at Virgil Films. Um, we got to see what their pitch deck looks like uh, for mm. all the pitches they're going to make. Uh, it looks super exciting. Um, really, really loved the visuals. I loved how they had laid out the episodes. We had done a lot of the work giving them the text. They kind of laid it out. They told us what else they needed to flesh that out. We had a good meeting yesterday. So um, that's exciting. And basically the plan is we get this pitch deck finished in the next week or two. We're going to pitch it end of August, 1st of September. And the plan is to pitch it to everyone they're going to pitch it to within a week. So everybody, all of the streamers, all of the cable networks, they're going to pitch it to them all at the same time. Uh, everybody gets a shot. And then, you know, hopefully there's more than one group that's interested in talking with us. Um, and we'll probably ask between four and five million up front to finish this eight to 10 series on the Brave Dutch. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, they still feel very strongly that this is going to be a powerful, exciting story. Uh, it's going to be very female heavy. Uh, so we've got a lot of Dutch people that are uh, feature prominently in our story. So uh, that are women. So we're going to, I'm super excited about that. We're going to get to do the, you know, females of world war two in a sense. So, That's so that incredible. was great. Yeah. And um, today uh, this is super exciting. Yesterday I got the copyright from the library of Congress. For those of you that actually are watching, I'm going to show you what a copyright yes looks like from the library of congress now is any backwards. of that confidential is there anything about that that's probably shouldn't be shown on I youtube don't think or so it's just okay. my registration number and the date and uh it shows my company name and my name on there and it feels like you know real like legit paper and Ooh. i don't know that was super a wonderful feeling it definitely looks like it's more like resume paper or something. Like yeah, it's real heavy, it's not, thick paper yeah. with a watermark. It's the real Ooh. deal. So Fancy. so that was cool. That came in, and um, I was writing uh, our copyright attorney. We uh, talked to him before, uh, Trevor Schmidt, who lives in North Carolina, um, to see if he could get back on the Brave Dutch. He did such a great job for us. So um, so that was exciting. So, yeah, that's that's the news for the Brave Dutch this week. That's awesome. 
Yeah. I am going to start doing a little bit more um, talking about the Brave Dutch. Uh, and eventually I've got to figure out, are we going to shut the Girl Who Wore Freedom podcast down and start another one? I don't really know. But um, <laughs> today I talked with Myra Miller of Footsteps Researchers. She's an amazing partner. Uh, she What she does is helps people research the footsteps of their ancestors that were in World War II. Oh, wow. And so she's helping us with this project. And I gave her a bunch of the top secret documents that have been declassified that we have for this story. She found all of these um, coordinates in them and she was able to plot them in a map to find every coordinate where he, he was from the last known coordinate in the air of the plane all the way to when he got back you know, behind allied lines. And she took me through this map and showed me every point where he was on this map down to houses and that's incredible it really was incredible what she does so i want to have her on the podcast at some point to demonstrate exactly what she can do for people that are trying to locate you know things like this in the world you know people and where they went in the world war ii um you know field um so yeah and that's that's the work we're doing on the brave dutch well, that is awesome. Um, do you have anything else you want to you want to touch on? I know we talked about this being a shorter episode. Do you have anything else yeah. you want to talk so, about? So I do have a little, a few little updates. Um, one is that uh, over the Fourth of July holiday, we were back on we were back in the top two hundred on iTunes. So I was excited to see that. At awesome. least that means we have some sales happening. So that's great. It continues to be a, a very sore point of contention and a thorn in my side that we can't be watched anywhere else other than iTunes or Apple TV. Um, the good people at Virgil films, however, uh, have made a wonderful offer. And, you know, we were talking, David Patterson, and I were talking to them and wondered if it might be possible for them to operate as our sales agent with all of their contacts at the big places. Um, you know, and we would be able to give them a portion of the back end, my back end, um, if any sale took place. Well, he said, yeah, I'd absolutely consider that. I think this is a phenomenal film and I'd really like to see it, you know, get more airtime. Um, but I'm not going to do that without the permission of Factory Film Studio. So we were like, Dave was like, OK, well, I'll reach out to Factory Film Studio and I'll see if maybe they would be interested in partnering with Virgil Films. What I've learned is that's called a sub distributor and that is possible uh, where, you know, one distributor will reach out to all of their contacts and pass the, you know, contract on to, you know, the signed distributor, but there have to be legal documents in place. And so FFS said he was open to talking to them. So hopefully that will get, they knew each other and hopefully that will get things moving and maybe that will open up some doors for the girl who wore freedom. So that was that was super exciting. Have you ever just sat back and thought about every single person who you've met because of this film? <laughs> it's got to be know. it can't just be hundreds at this point. Like it's got to be thousands. <laughs> yeah, and it is that oh it is totally thousands. And the interesting thing I was thinking about this um you know when people ask, you know, is our film festivals worth it and should you go? Um I look back and like this particular thing happened because of a film festival. So I went to the Julian Dubuque Film Festival. I was on a panel with Donna Reed's daughter. Donna Reed's daughter, Mary, introduced me to Joe at Amodai at Virgil Films, who watched the film and is like, oh my gosh, we have to distribute it. And that was the beginning of that relationship um, that was born out of a festival connection. And you know, now, you know, they're moved on to our next project because they see the potential there. And when people talk about, you know, okay, after you get one in the can and, um, you know, you really, you really have other opportunities in my mind, in my imagination, like, I think I've said this before on the podcast, I thought, oh, people were going to come out of the woodworks, but it happens a lot more intrinsically, you know, like, is that the right word? Intrinsically? I'm not sure. So. Or organically. organically, organically, yeah, organically. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, yeah, it happens more organically than that. And that's kind of where we are. So um, I'm super thankful uh, for that. Uh, the only other update uh, with the film is that um, I am putting together this big deal with L'Oreal, Michelin, Fort Bragg, and Delta, where maybe we will bring Danny and Flo over, bring some veterans. And 
that has been a lot of pitching to these companies, writing sort of a proposal. Um, it works a lot differently in the corporate world, dealing with people than it does in the film world. Uh, and and there, again, having a person inside each company championing you, championing you, is that the word? I don't even know how you're saying, being a champion for your product, um, that has made all the difference in the world. So for Delta, we've watched, you know, Virginie Durr is the one who worked there. She's been pushing this all the way through. That's how we got on Delta, which comes out uh, apparently on their planes August 4, 1st through 10th. Um, well, now and I then, have to, <laughs> so and it's now only you have to fly Delta. Point. Yeah, I got I got a book of flight. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, David Chapman was uh, in Michelin. So that's how that happened. But David Chapman also has a um, his client is Fort Bragg. So David's representing us at Michelin and Fort Bragg. And he made those two opportunities happen. And then uh, I have a student, a, a woman, Andra, who we went to high school together. She happens to work in L'Oreal. She's part, she's an ally for the veterans group and she has been uh, our champion at L'Oreal. So individual people picking up the mantle of your cause um, really do make such a huge difference, um, you know, in unexpected ways. So, you know, networking and relationships are everything. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. I, I'm excited to see where, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny to, to, to be talking about the next thing because it still feels like this thing is still, you know, it's not it's not quite done yet. And that's that's the thing about films is they're a living thing that just kind of keeps going forever at this point. Well, and, and typically, you know, it's actually true when you have an evergreen property where it is going to keep continue, you know, continue to be managed. And I was thinking about this today. David Patterson has said it over and over and over again, you know. You have to be involved with the selling. Now, could have could we have stepped back when FFS said, here's your distribution deal for five years, we're going to sell the film for you. Could I have just left it in their hands and walked away? Of course I could have. And I could have forgotten about it and moved along. Um, and I would, it would be over. But uh, the fact of the matter is, if I want to break even, if I want to um, you know, possibly ever make money, I'm going to have to stand on the wall and I'm going to have to watch and make sure that, you know, this happens in every way possible. And I have to continue to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And um, I don't think that responsibility is ever going to leave when you're an independent filmmaker and you own the film. Now, things will change with the with the Brave Dutch. If a company decides to advance us the money, they will own the property. So if if Netflix, let's just use them as an example, gives us the money to make the film, this will become a Netflix original and we will do what we do. They will give us lots of notes. Uh, it will be shaped by their creative directors. Um, in the end, it will be something that they own, but I will have directed a Netflix original thing. And that's the trade off there. And then Which, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. No, especially when I haven't been paid for this one. And I really, really yep. need to uh, get out of this big hole I'm in. So uh, plus, you know, hopefully then if I do well and the series does well, there will be other opportunities after that as well. So, you know, you just never know. This is an, an, an incredibly uh, surprising adventure all the time. You never know uh, which way things are going to turn. But I do think it's important to stay positive, stay committed, stay involved, um, and always believe that, um, you know, there's more out there that you can accomplish. You just have to be willing to go get it. Well, awesome. My well, thank you for sharing all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing all that with us, Christian. And uh, thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>